Tonight, we're starting a whole new feature, the Primetime Behavior Lab. We're going to show you people doing really surprising, sometimes even ridiculous things. Think you wouldn't do them? Well, you may have to think again. Here's John Quinones. In an elevator, when you enter, you face the front. Now, what happens when you walk into an elevator in which everybody is facing the rear? It was a classic episode of the old Candid Camera Show. People getting onto an elevator and then turning backwards just because everyone else did. We all laughed. Forty years later, we laughed again during the movie Mean Girls when an act of teenage revenge, cutting nasty Queen Bee Regina's t-shirt during gym class, an act meant to insult her, resulted in a school fashion trend instead. Now it turns out the joke's on us. These two examples illustrate something that we humans don't like to often admit about ourselves to ourselves. We follow the pack, like birds in a flock, like sheep in a pasture, like salmon swimming upstream. We follow, sometimes at our own peril. But why? That's what we've set out to discover. We've gathered a group of unsuspecting people for a test of what we call visual perception. But our primetime lab is really after a question far more revealing. What makes people follow each other? It's the question that Dr. Gregory Burns of Atlanta's Emory University answered in a recent groundbreaking paper. So compelling, we set up a demonstration recreating his work. The actual test is simple, to take geometric shapes and compare them to see if they're alike or different. On your marks. Get set. <laughs> Go. First, our volunteers have to write down their answers to 10 questions privately. Then they have to give the next series of answers out loud for everyone to hear. Jocelyn, if you can begin, this is number 11. But this verbal test comes with a twist. Jocelyn is in on the experiment. Different. Different. Everyone else has been told to follow her lead, except for Tony, who's the only one in the room not in the know. He's being set up to see if he'll follow the pack. When the group gives the right answer, he agrees. Same. But even when the shapes are vastly different, same, same, Tony still gives the wrong answer. He follows the pack. Now, what's really going on? Everyone else had the answers for the verbal part beforehand. Mm -hmm. Unwittingly, Tony has demonstrated Dr. Burns' point precisely by going along with the wrong answers. You know, five people have seen it, and I'm not. It's the only way. <laughs> Something's wrong. But, you know, I just felt out of place. I just went along with the answers. The group's influence on Tony profoundly altered the results. He went from 90% on his written test to just 10% when he heard the other's answers. And Tony was not alone. We changed the hot seat seven times. Eric got 100 on the written exam, but when he followed the others... You got 60%, right? I was definitely influenced by the group. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's David and Graham. Unlike the others, they had the courage of their convictions, giving the right answers, even when the group did not. I wanted to go with what I felt was the correct answer and trust myself, and so that's what I did. I think you did great. You stuck to your guns. If you we'll get we, back we, to what all this means in a minute. But what about outside the lab? We try our experiment in real life, at dinner, to see if we can replicate our results on a more social scale. The place, 66, John George's Asian restaurant in Lower Manhattan. Primetime has invited these people here for a fabulous evening and a surprise. Would you like to come share the menu with us? Our host, celebrity party planner and TV personality, Colin Cowie, a man who has planned sumptuous and sophisticated parties for the rich and famous all over the world. Our secret experiment, this time we're focusing on manners. We've asked Colin, along with his friend and partner in this etiquette caper, Donna De Cruz, to do some outlandish things that most polite people would never even think of doing. 
Our dinner guests this evening are actually unwitting test subjects. Although they don't know it, we'll be watching them to see if they go along with the group, even in a social setting. First, Colin and Donna lick their fingers, a dinner table no-no. And I don't know if Europeans do Then Colin even picks his teeth. But our guests, all perfect strangers and perfectly proper, initially seem not to take the bait until dessert comes and the barriers <laughs> fall. Uh, we're all family now. Our face. Then no, you go like this, face first. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone digs in. People who were total strangers at the beginning of the evening are now literally passing fruit mouth to mouth. See? See, you were just greedy. You ate the whole thing without asking. Don't ask him. you might be fine, but we're looking for fabulous. <laughs> Only Harold and Maria, a Canadian couple, pass on all the gustatory familiarity. And finally, our holdout, Harold, is the only one who dares ask the question. <laughs> what is the topic for tonight? What was the topic for tonight? And Colin explains. I did things that I would never do at the table. She started to eat the mango with her hands, and the next one we were passing it around the table. I was sitting here, I heard. I would never pick up chicken or I wasn't ribs. sure. I think because we broke the rules and we made things possible at the table, so everybody followed suit with it. What does swaying our guests at a dinner party have in common with swaying the answers on Dr. Burns' test? Different as they are, they're both examples of our human need to conform. In fact, Dr. Burns' experiment is a variation of one done many years ago by another scientist trying to decipher a horrific example of conformity. Why so many Germans followed Adolf Hitler down the path to death and destruction? And the link to our experiment? Well, there are two ways to explain our subject's behavior. One is that they know what their eyes are telling them, and yet they choose to ignore it and go along with the group to belong to the group. The second explanation, that hearing other opinions, even if they're wrong, can actually change what we see, distorting our own perceptions. Is it possible that by enough people telling you what's happening, even if your eyes are telling you something different, that you can come to see what the other people are telling you? To find out, Dr. Byrne and his subjects' brains at the moment of decision. The results were startling. Dr. Burns found that his subjects' brains lit up, not here where thinking takes place, but here in the back where vision occurs. People actually believed what others told them they were seeing and not what their own eyes took in. Their brains were scrambling the messages. And what that suggests is that what people tell you, if enough people are telling you, can actually get mixed in with what your own eyes are telling you. And for those who went against the group, an intriguing result. Their brains lit up in a place called the amygdala. Which is basically the fear center of the brain. And what we're seeing here is the fear of standing alone. If you feel naked standing out there and sort of going against them and saying, you're seeing something entirely different. So why do people follow the pack, no matter how ridiculous it seems? Perhaps it's not so much about good and evil, right or wrong, smart or stupid. It might be, as Dr. Burns' experiment suggests, that our brains get confused between what they see and what others tell us. And just knowing that should help us guard against following the pack. <laughs>